Well, first of all, uh, welcome to the Depp Center, named after a great man who promoted many women, uh, Richard Depps, who passed away recently. Uh, he was the board chair during one of TV's critical periods after the Reformation uh, of the university following the Civil War. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today for this signal event that's hosted by the uh, Global Engagement Center and the Osfari Institute. Um, and it's very fitting that it's about uh, gender equality initiatives and the elevation of women, women's rights, women's issues uh, on a global scale and uh, talking about what universities can do. Uh, relatively uh, briefly, I'm going to say that the university's been undergoing a significant journey uh, with regard to women's issues, empowerment of women uh, on many levels. So I think the most obviously successful has been with regard to women's leadership. Uh, on our main campus, we went from eight or nine percent uh, women leadership in the high touch positions to 45 percent. We're, we're not there yet, good progress in, in eight years. Under the uh, guidance of Dr. Faisal Lukak, who's here today, we have tremendous awareness of women's sexual health issues, uh, which is a topic that is not discussed appropriately or adequately in many parts of the world, I can say, as a physician, uh, this really is an issue. Uh, we have, I would argue, the most robust Title IX program, I think, in the region where people are held accountable for their behaviors with regard to power dynamics, and I think it's fair to say the faculty, staff, and students get it. Uh, but that's probably not enough, because I can see that in some countries, um, they think the solution is to have a minister for women's affairs. Well, women are 50-something percent of the population, and that seems like a little bit of a, an anachronism. And Lebanon still has only, what, Lena, five women? Five or six? Parliamentarian, six. Six. And Out of 128. Out of 128. 128 people mostly doing very little to advance the cause of Lebanon. So only six women can be blamed. Uh, but only one woman minister yes. right now and 24 yes. members. So very embarrassing, okay, and very inappropriate. Uh, but it's about much more than the number of women. It's about bringing forth the issues that help us progress as a society. Uh, and uh, for us, I think it's critical that we grasp these issues and the role of the university at a time when we can make a difference. And why do I say that? Well, being completely undiplomatic, I'll leave that to, to you ladies. In the 1990s, in, in America at least, the university endowments grew to a degree that most universities made the decision to bring in people who would manage the donors, keep them happy, but not deal with some of the core issues for academia. And the core issues are academ of academia are more complex than uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are important issues, but you've seen a backlash against them now from people who want to prevent equality. But the core issues of, uh, of academia center around a voyage of self-discovery for the students and self self realization, self-fulfillment uh, that has been denied for women for in most parts of the world until recently. Um, the result has been an, an attack on the academies in, in, in the West, from which I think they're starting to think their way out of it. I'm not loud enough, okay? That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, how are they starting to, to think their way out of it? I think through allowing space, although that's not necessarily true right now at US universities and German universities, for activism, allowing space for people to express very different ideas. And if you look at the history of universities coming to grips with new ideas, challenging dogma, that has been about the least privileged folks in the relationship, be it minorities, African Americans in the US, women demanding a voice in the evolution of academic institutions and other institutions. And I'm happy to say 
that at AUB at least we have a very strong sense and lots of credit to, to Nina uh, about the intersection of academia and activism. It's something we have to be careful about because you're seeing even some of the universities most famous for activism, including in the city, quieting it down so that there can be a consensus. Look, I love consensus as much as the next person, uh, but consensus should be arrived at by allowing people to express themselves fully. And for that, we're very grateful that at the American University of Beirut, we have a number of strong women leaders who are unafraid to challenge dogma. And so that's what I hope you'll all do today. I hope you will feel free to challenge convention, to, can, to challenge dogma. Societies are defined by their willingness to not accept good enough or what is told to them as the way things are uh, in order to realize real progress. And for that, we're grateful for your presence, and I thank you. I apologize if I've gone on too long and too softly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, President Huri, and again, welcome, everybody. Um, I just want, so I will be your moderator today. I'm Lina Abu Habib, and I'm the director of the Osprey Institute at the American University of Beirut. And I want to recognize and acknowledge the immense work that was uh, done in the conceptualization and in the preparation of this event. So thank you, Dr. Tania Haddad, the director of the Global Engagement Initiative, and uh, my wonderful colleague, Carla Ail, and also our wonderful colleague, Dr. Faisal Qa. Uh, getting us here took a lot of conversations and discussions, but I want to say that uh, that's part of an initiative that we started at AUB looking at tools that are likely to be appropriated by social movements in promoting gender equality, essentially foreign feminist policies. Uh, on March 8th, as every year, we celebrated uh, International Women's Rights Day at AUB, and it was with, in collaboration with our friends from the government of Mexico and Chile and Brazil uh, around feminist foreign policies as, again, not in terms of just saying this is going to resolve all the problems, but how can they resolve all the problems and what are the gaps that we are seeing, particularly against a, a background of increasing conflict, increasing economic disparities, increasing oppression and abuses. And I'm hoping that this is a conversation that we're continuing uh, today with our six wonderful speakers. And I want to start with um, Minister Gron Lassonen, Am I getting it right now? Very well. <laughs> uh, Minister Lasorin has an amazing track record in as, um, in, in, as a politician, uh, and also as somebody who has championed gender equality. Um, and I was talking with your ambassador in Lebanon, um, Anne uh, Miskanen, and she was saying, you know, maybe Finland doesn't have a, a, a foreign feminist policy as such, uh, it has been branded by Sweden, yes. uh, but, and we're getting to OSA, uh, but actually it, Finland practices at least domestically. And so I wanted to talk to you as uh, representing a country that doesn't have until now something specific called foreign feminist policy, but who has done quite a lot in terms of promoting pro-equality policies. So would you share with us your experiences on advancing gender equality through a process that may not be branded now, as uh, uh, Arne says, but which looks very much like a feminist foreign policy. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you for an excellent question as well. Uh, Finland might not call it, like, in everyday life, a feminist foreign policy, but Finland, of course, and all the Nordic countries are very feminist uh, in our very basic uh, basic values. And we also lead by example. For example, Finnish women have had very meaningful leadership role in, in Finnish politics already decades. Um, at the moment, I'm in, in a government where we have uh, 12 out of 19 uh, government members that are women. So it's very much women-led uh, 
policy we do. And we've had women holding the positions of head of state, foreign ministers, prime ministers. Uh, so long tradition of, of women leadership position. And also here in, in the UN, I just came from, um, from a uh, seminar held for um, celebrating Helvi Sipila, the very first uh, assistant general secretary yes. of UN. Those women already in 70 something. So that's great. But maybe um, start, I would like to start by, by extending my sincere gratitude to the University, American University of Beirut and to the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Leader, uh, Citizenship and Global Engagement Initiative for uh, organizing this uh, esteemed event. And I would also like to thank our co-sponsors and co-organizers, Mexico, uh, UN Women and the NGO Commission of them, CSW for being here today with us. Uh, we're working towards a common, a common goal of uh, eradicating poverty and let us stay true to that commitment of leaving no one behind. The Southwest Asia and North uh, African region has a young population with much potential. For a, a good sustainable future, we need financing for gender equality. Official development assistance, private sector investments and domestic public finance must be done uh, in a gender transformative manner. Effective uh, taxation can finance public services, reduce inequalities and create a sound operating environment for companies. To ensure financial development, we need to ensure mutual rights, adequate funding and represent representation for all citizens of uh, Swana region. The rights of women and girls uh, in all, all of their diversity and their participation in society are keys to a well-functioning democracy. The participation of women and girls in all areas of foreign and security policy and empowering them in decision-making leads to a more sustainable, prosperous and peaceful reality and future. In a world where these rights are constantly under attack, for example, by the anti-gender movement, we must be uh, relentless in, um, in our com uh, commitments to foster uh, gender equality. Women and girls uh, living in poverty experience multiple and compounding uh, deprivations, including being denied uh, <coughs> a decent education, lower standard of living, worse um, food security and nutrition, lack of adequate housing and limited access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Several uh, other factors, including race, ethnicity, <coughs> disability, uh, place of resistance, um, marital and migrant status, HIV status, sexual orientation and gender identity, are factors that unfortunately intensify inequality. Lack of access to decent work and economic uh, resources is one of the main drivers of women's uh, poverty. Labor markets often re uh, reproduce gender inequalities. Globally, just about 62% uh, of women aged 25 to 54 were engaged in labor, labor, force, since, uh, labor force in 2022, compared with more than 90% of men in the same age range. The gender gap in employment uh, has persisted for two decades. Employment gaps, uh, occupational segregation, uh, and the higher uh, likelihood of part-time employment increases the gendered income in inequality. Women also deserve equal pay from work of equal value. Discrimination against women and girls means less potential uh, fulfilled, less income, less well-being, and less security. No society can afford to overlook half of its population to close the gap globally and in Swana region requires gender conscious budgeting and gender conscious spending. It requires foreign policy with a gender transformative approach. Uh, Finland, together with other Nordic country, uh, countries, has excellent cooperation with the uh, AUB and the uh, Aspari Institute. 
Supported by uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers, we are working on a project aimed at enhancing women's political and economic empowerment in Lebanon. The project is called uh, Shifting Narratives Towards Economic and Political Empowerment of Women in, in Lebanon. Acknowledging the underrepresentation of women in these spheres, our mutual uh, work is focused on uh, targeted advocacy and to the identification of new political initiatives. We recognize the macroeconomic impact of gender equality and we strive to address uh, the low rates of women lab labor market participation and political representation in, in Lebanon. And I believe that through initiatives and, and foreign policy cooperation like this, we can find models to improve gender equality in the whole Swana region. The promotion of uh, women's and girls' rights and gender equality has been at the heart of um, the uh, different uh, dimensions of uh, Finland's foreign policy for years. My country is focused in, in supporting sustainable development and we are supporting the rights and representation of women and girls in all their diversity. Finland knows very well from, from its own history that a well-functioning democracy, the rule of law, human rights and a vibrant um, civil society are prerequisites and catalysts for social development. The priorities of my government's development policy includes improving the right, uh, right to uh, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, of women and girls. Actors mm -hmm. like Aspari Institute, for Civil Society and uh, Citizenship, and the AUB, who bring together a dynamic community of academics, uh, practitioners, um, and civil society actors with decision makers can do and do make a difference. And dear friends, working for uh, rights, funding, and representation against the backdrop of, drop of uh, rising anti rights movements globally and in the Swana region is not easy. And to succeed, we need political commitment and financing for gender equality. Let us not, let us leave no one behind. So, thank you very much, and I very much look forward to, to uh, discussion and, and learning. Also. Thank you, Minister. I will notice uh, the use of the uh, terminology SWANA uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a decolonized term, and uh, you know I, I want to acknowledge yeah. uh, um, the intention intentionality in, in in using it. So thank you very much. And again, uh, it's been um, it's been a learning process working with the Nordic uh, uh, Council of Ministers in co-creating together initiatives that are based on uh, the lived experiences of women in a particularly difficult context of political and economic disenfranchisement. So I want to acknowledge also how important it has been, especially as we're moving, uh, we're moving forward with, the, with, the, with this initiative at a time when the context is getting even more and more difficult, hence the importance. So thank you so much. Um, 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 Ms. Elisa Buenrostro, she is the uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of Mexico in the UN. Uh, and I, I want to, I want to just to say that we've been, AUB has been collaborating with Mexico for quite some time, particularly with uh, Colegio de Mexico. So it has been an amazing collaboration. And we have begun this work on exploring and unpacking foreign feminist policy with uh, the Mexican government. Uh, this is because, of course, from the Latin America part of the world, Mexico has been the first country to adopt a feminist foreign policy. I think Chile is the most recent mm -hmm. one, if I'm not mistaken. So, so basically, you come with four years of experimenting, and we've had a really good mm -hmm. conversation about what this has meant and what kind yeah. of learning you're bringing with you in experimenting with a foreign feminist policy, both domestically and, and globally. So over to you, Anisha. Thank you very much, Linia. And first of all, I want to, to thank uh, President uh, Curry and uh, congratulate you for this venue, amazing venue of, uh, of the American University of Beirut. Mexico has very strong links with the Lebanese uh, community in Mexico. It's uh, very active and uh, 
in a super nice community, I would say I love everything from Lebanon, from food you know, <laughs> to, you know, it's Normally, fine. Normally, uh, the diaspora is, is, is uh, embarrassing, so I hope you haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> and your people, you know, Lebanese people are just amazing. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning. And um, yes, before starting, I would like to say that uh, now I feel more comfortable talking about a feminist foreign policy because imagine, you know, I don't like saying what something is when we don't have the real basis of, uh, of what could a, foreign, a feminist foreign policy could be or how should it uh, be developed and be evolving and so on. So um, I said to my foreign minister, who by the way, she is an amazing foreign minister, She's Alicia Barsena, who used to be an undersecretary here, and she's so active and you know committed and so on. So when we said, you know, Minister, we need to start from scratch, you know, and from scratch I mean that the, in the foreign ministry, the first thing that you think about a feminist foreign policy is that women in foreign policy should be empowered at some point in order to be able to assume better positions and, and be in the decision-making process and so on and high, high and take uh, higher responsibilities. So we said yes, we need to start and uh, we need to start from scratch and that means like starting by, you know, latency rooms, you know. Let's start also by having, you know, positions at the different departments, the European department or the multilateral or Latin American department or whatever it is, with positions for women who have children that are very little children or are in their adolescence and that they can only work part time. But that, that doesn't mean that they are, you know, affected or impacted negatively in the way they can still keep on moving in their careers, you know, that we move from a uh, diplomatic attaché to a third secretary, second secretary. And in the case of Mexico, it's done through um, very uh, competitive exams. So it's a worn out process of around 20 years. Um, so we said, yes, we need to start from that. Then having, of course, you know, we need our partners uh, to be able to work whenever they accompany us at an embassy and we are uh, posted somewhere, if our husband, partner, wife, whatever it is, you know, if they cannot develop themselves and be a, a constructive part uh, in the relationship, it's a very difficult one. So it's important to have, you know, sign all possible agreements so that partners are able also to work. So that sort of things from the very beginning and for us, it's like really starting to help uh, women at the foreign ministry and start to empower them. Um, so I want to say uh, back again, um, I want to say thank you and uh, come back uh, to how did we start. So I'll divide my five minute intervention in three parts. I'll talk about the Mexican <coughs> feminist foreign policy and its elements. Then I will give some examples of feminist foreign uh, policy actions. And lastly, I will share some <coughs> details on the third uh, feminist foreign policy that will be hosted by Mexico. And probably I will start by the, by the third one. Mexico will be hosting the third feminist foreign policy. We have already had one in Germany, another one in the Netherlands, and Mexico will hold the third one. It will take place from July the 1st to July the 3rd. It will be presided over by our foreign minister. And yesterday we had a, a very interesting feminist foreign policy um, side event at CR1. It was packed. I was very happy about that. And, um, and we spoke about the different uh, experiences in how we have implemented. Because, this is a, uh, because it's a new way of doing things and it's a new avenue, we need uh, the possibility of learning from different experiences becomes even more important. So um, we would love to see you all there. So for my country, for Mexico, having an F FFP means not only that more women should be participating in foreign policy decisions, it also implies the mainstreaming, the mainstreaming of a gender perspective in all foreign relations. So we start from the beginning, you know, as issues that I have mentioned, you know, lactancy, uh, me, uh, 
rooms and then having uh, part-time um, positions and so on. And at the same time, mainstreaming this gender perspective in all our foreign relations, in all the meetings, in all negotiations, even though if it's a trade, a free trade agreement or if it's a cultural agreement or whatever, just uh, do, do not forget about the, the gender perspective here. And uh, of course, women's and girls' rights in all their diversity and recognizing the contributions of women to, the, to diplomacy and to international politics. So Mexico, as Lena said, you know, we announced the adoption of this feminist foreign policy in January 2020, so it's been four years. At that time, Mexico proposed that this initiative uh, was a set of principles that seek to guide actions to reduce and to eliminate structural differences, gaps and gender inequalities, so as to build a more just and prosperous society. Then Mexico became the first country in Latin America and in all the global south to announce its commitment to feminist foreign policy, promoting guidelines of a multilateral policy that would be dedicated to a gender equality and to a non-discrimination agenda. So our feminist foreign policy recognizes and is coherent with Mexico's very long tradition in multilateral fora promoting the recognition of women's girls and rights. And the FFP is equally consistent with the committed practice of consular protection. And so now I will, I will comment on the five principles of our feminist foreign policy. Number one, the first one proposes to maintain and strengthen Mexico's leadership in international, uh, at the international stage to advance multilateral agenda towards gender equality. The second one, its uh, principle, is about parity, and it builds on Mexico's advances on this area, promoting parity in Mexican foreign service. We have still a lot to do in this area. I can tell you that only around 38, 37% of the total uh, number of ambassadors have become uh, women ambassadors, and that we still are very much <coughs> lagging behind. Now, I would also like to say that in terms of parity, in the case of Mexico, we um, achieved uh, full gender uh, parity in, uh, at, the, at Congress, both in the upper and in the, in the lower chambers of Congress, and we will have the first presidential um, uh, woman president because both uh, the candidate from the opposition and the candidate from the official party um, both are women. So this is the first time in a 200 year uh, history of an independent country um, that we will have a woman president at the top. Third. The, uh, the third principle refers to a zero tolerance policy to harassment and gender violence. We have been very active in this regard. The foreign ministry has taken also, um, and in particular the foreign minister herself, this very seriously. We have an ethics committee, a commission that fo follows and you know takes action. And, um, and, th and this is also in our diplomatic and the consular uh, branches that we have. Remember that Mexico has only in this country 53 consulates because we have uh, the presence of more than 40 million people of Mexican origin living in the United States. <laughs> the fourth principle promotes the recognition of contributions made by women diplomats to diplomacy and to foreign policy. And finally, the fifth one stands for addressing intersecting forms of discrimination faced by women and girls, including those based on race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, disability, and other factors. We have been here at the United Nations very, very active I in this regard. If it's about um, women with disabilities, indigenous women, uh, of course, girls, and um, sexuality of any form. So we, we have been um, very active and uh, outspoken in this regard. And Mexico's feminist foreign policy must be, we realize that it has to be compre comprehensive, action-oriented, <coughs> and a multi-actor multi instrument which includes civil society and other actors' contributions. Uh, we have already listened in the case of Finland, um, 
democracy flourishes where civil society plays yeah. a constructive role. Uh, Mexican civil society is much more, I would say 25 years ago or 30 years ago, it was the very beginning of this process. Now you can tell, you can see how um, only here at the uh, CSW, uh, you look around and there are students all around, uh, representatives from NGOs, and we believe that they are very strong voice, uh, represent a very strong voice and force in order to be able to move things forward. So since the adoption of our FFP and honoring Mexico's tradition on multilateral spaces, uh, progress has been made on the implementation of feminist foreign policies. I'm sure we'll have more time to share about these experiences, and I'll mention some of the experience, experiences and examples in different poli uh, foreign policy areas. So first, one of Mexico's achievements within the framework of its feminist foreign policy is the co-presidency together with France of the Generation Equality Forum, uh, where the Global <laughs> Alliance for Care was launched with the committed cooperation of UN Women. Yes, we have absolutely. <laughs> Yes, now, um, so I think that Generation Equality Forum was a completely different way of structuring things and presenting them. Uh, the fact that we, it was a multi-stakeholders with lots of alliances and so on, uh, we keep, uh, we need to keep on going and uh, we need to keep on doing our homework in that regard. Secondly, we just became a few days ago uh, co-chairs with Spain um, of the, group of feminist foreign policy countries here, of the 19 countries that have so far feminist foreign policy. So for a year, Spain and Mexico will be presiding over. Our first event was yesterday. And, um, and, and, and that group is, as I said, here in New York. And we will keep on doing lots of things. First of all, now we want to launch our logo, no? To have a logo of what it means in you know, a feminist foreign policy. So we need to think about the main elements and ingredients that need to be in that uh, beautiful logo that I imagine. Okay, then, also with, within the framework of its feminist foreign policy, Mexico has adopted two national action plans resulting from agreements negotiated at the multilateral level. So in January 2021, Mexico adopted its first national action plan um, on the implementation of Resolution 1325 that all of you, uh, we all know about it, on women, peace, and security, and follow up on the women, peace, and security agenda in 2023, Mexico promoted and launched the Ibero-American Network of Women Mediators. That, I believe, is a very important thing. There are many alliances that are made up of uh, different uh, mediators. I believe very much, if we're saying here at the UN, that women have all these uh, characteristics within their identity, uh, the way of uh, th their sensitivity and the way uh, they do things in general from uh, more feminist energy and so on, and that as leaders, we can do a lot in terms of peace processes. I also believe that um, we need it from our region as well, Spain, Portugal, and the rest of the Americas, uh, to have our own, because they are already in Europe, they are already in Asia, and so on. What we really want to do is to see mediators moving in the ladder. You know, we need to know more about what have been the experiences of others, work on training and capacity building, and then see how we can really promote them to be part of you know the group or the team of the special representative of the secretary general, let's say to Myanmar or to um, whatever Bosnia Herzegovina or the Sahara, the Western Sahara, and so on. We need to do that because if we believe we need, we cannot only rely on quotas and so on. I believe much more. I think they are important, but I believe as well that we really need to prepare ourselves. Now, the same way as, for example, now um, in my country in, and in general in Europe or in the United States, they need, you know, all firms, uh, all enterprises need for their advisory boards, they need women. And they cannot put women just because you are a woman. You also need to be uh, related to the matters and, and be um, 
acquainted and, and, and have studied in this regard. So we need also to prepare ourselves because there are many fields. But the one I love the most is mediation. And I believe that, for example, in the case of my country, which, you know, it's uh, Mexico, it's a great country. I've been serving it for 33 years already. But we also face many, many challenges. And those challenges have to do with uh, inequality and have to do in that regard with poverty. And it has to do also with security, safety, and so on because of the drugs issue that come to the United States. So in that regard, I believe that women are the most important factor to recover the social tissue in my country. And in the same way, I believe that in the international arena and in the international dimension, they have a very important role to play. So we launched that uh, Ibero-American mediation uh, group um, a few months ago, and it had its first meeting only three weeks ago. So we are very interested also in uh, creating synergies with other groups of mediation. And lastly, um, I'm very happy to share what I meant said that we will host the international summit in July with Alicia Barcena. The summit will propose to connect its debates with discussions taking, uh, taking place on the Pact of the Future. So if you remember well, the Pact of the Future <coughs> has several chapters. You know, it has uh, peace and security, it has development, it has technology, innovation, and so on. It has governance, what else? Multilateral reform and future Multilateral reform and, and future generations. So we are connecting all these chapters of the Pact of the Future before we have the Summit of the Future in September with our feminist foreign policy. And finding an avenue where we can match those and see where the gender uh, issue and, uh, and uh, action-oriented issues can we can identify, and that might probably uh, we will be able to to bring them to the to the pact of the future. So um, this summit uh, we will have discussion panels, current policies and strategies on gender equality in foreign policy. Uh, we will explore those. We will try to identify best practices and lessons learned analyze the main challenges and obstacles hindering progress in gender equality in foreign policy, and of course, trying to propose some solutions. Let's start. I think that we should be, we will invite countries, oh, of course, all of you, but also the ones with communist foreign policies. And we want, for example, one particular country, if it's on technologies, let's say Finland, no? And, and to Finland, you know, with its group working in the summit, uh, have one action, you know, to be proposed. So that in the end we have five actions, only five, because what we need to do is really feed up and try for this to evolve in a nicely constructive and positive way and, um, and have innovative solutions. So in this regard, we are counting with you and we would love to see you, all of you. I don't know whether it will be in Cancun or in Mexico City, but Whatever it is, it will be an amazing summit. So we will we would like to have you there and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Alicia, you will definitely see me. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you. I think you want to uh, go to, to, another to, to another meeting. But thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks no, I have to say it. FFP and, and, and for hematologists is fresh frozen plasma. They <laughs> <laughs> give to stop bleeding in a pregnant woman who has pre. Very good. <laughs> Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Life saving. Yes, yes. Like both FFPs. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to turn to Osa. Uh, Osa is currently um, the CEO of Save the Children uh, and the foreign the former Minister for Children, the Elderly, and Gender Equality in Sweden. Um, it, it, it's, it's a funny combination, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. it, it just cannot be just Minister of Gender Equality. It has to be <laughs> a lot of other stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, uh, um, first of all, thank you for being with us, Osa. And uh, you were a Minister for Gender Equality. It was under your watch that uh, you know Sweden uh, developed uh, its first uh, foreign, actually the first 
uh, feminist foreign policy. And when we, when we were having a conversation in preparation for this event, we talked about going back. Uh, so the first country to have a proper f foreign feminist policy and the first country to retract, which you know is um, really unfortunate. So do you, could you comment uh, on this track and on this journey and what has it meant, but also what have been the issues and the challenges uh, for Sweden's uh, uh, foreign feminist policy? Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, Minister. Thank you to all of you for being here and for this discussion. And thank you, Lena, for your leadership throughout the years. And we met each other because I'd, I've just done five years at UN Women with Lopa and under Sean, other beautiful colleagues from UN Women, where I think we also have the uh, benefit of, of comparing and seeing things, uh, different strategies that, that, that uh, countries, member states take on. Uh, so I think Lena, you and I, <laughs> we talk about a lot of things when we <laughs> discuss because there's so much to analyze. And I think we're all very concerned about where the world at, uh, at uh, is at at the moment uh, and uh, we, we uh, uh, yeah, on the same day we need to discuss uh, Gaza, Haiti, Sudan, uh, still Sahel, Syria, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, um, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, luckily we have m women colleagues from most of these countries here and many others as well <coughs> where there are uh, crises going on but I think that feminist foreign policy really is one of the solutions and we were saying had countries more countries really pursued feminist foreign policy we would have a ceasefire yes yeah. yes, yes. I also think that before, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief but th because there's so many experienced co colleagues here and so much to talk about, but I think it's also important to acknowledge before we kind of dive into all the um, hostilities and attacks on human rights and women's and girls' rights at the moment and the fundamentalism and, and the, the violence that's going on, I think it is important to remember, and that's what the CSW is about, that no one would have been here had it not been for feminists. And we would never have had the gains that we have had it not been for all of you. Because nothing in politics happens just like that. Feminism and women's rights is about per shifting power. And as far as I know, very few mm. men, because they have the majority of the power, wake up in the morning and say, mm, I think I want to write a law today that actually makes me lose quite a lot of that power. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It works with, <laughs> with women working together in many different ways. And had women not done that, we wouldn't have had the CEDAW, the 1325 debating platform, um, the CSW, um, and um, the, uh, all, all these important vehicles. Uh, that, that we all uh, relate to. Uh, neither would we have legislation against violence against women, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, education for girls, etc., etc. Um, so I think it's important to just remember that it is possible to change and it is the, the fruit of work of women and we can do it again, <laughs> hopefully together with more men. And I th uh, I think feminist foreign policy. Uh, I was the Minister of Gender Equality from 2014 to 18, and many of you I know know my dear friend and colleague Mar Margot Wallström, who was the Foreign Minister at the time. Uh, we are very good friends and we hang out a lot, and, but I think it's very important to acknowledge uh, Margot and her vision for this. So she was the Foreign Minister, I was the Gender Equality Minister at the time. Uh, and uh, Margot's recipe for this uh, were to uh, set up these three R's, the resources, rights and representation, to go with it. Uh, and it was also at a time where Sweden was running uh, for uh, a, a seat at the Security Council, which also succeeded. And as far as I understand, to, in, in relation to many of the, of the votes and the analysis of those votes was, you know, to a large extent because of this focus and the focus on, on women, children and, 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 and people in the Security Council. So I know also um, many years later there are many countries or, or 
it's a, the group is growing <laughs> of countries who are um, uh, acknowledging the feminist foreign policy as their own or who are uh, uh, very interested or working with, with women's ra rights as a focus of foreign policy. Uh, and I know also that this has been evaluated in different ways uh, throughout the years. And these have been years with more and more attacks on women's and girls' rights. So I think it has been very important. I think the Me Too uh, situation and, and the, the courageous women that came forward gave it another push. Uh, and I think that now it's really important to, to create some kind of pressure that in that way, again, it's much needed. In those follow-ups and evaluations, I know we have seen that a feminist foreign policy really does help when it comes to allocating resources, pursuing uh, or, uh, rights, driving rights, and to uh, promote women's representation. However, it's far too slow, and it's not enough. And I think now that I'm leading a, 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 a girls' and, and children's rights organization, Save the Children, a very uh, well-known organization, also the work of, of activists, I am very happy about the fact that children's rights um, get a lot of attention and resources, but I don't understand why women's organizations don't get the same uh, attention and resources. I've never understood that, and I won't, <laughs> because they are really connected, and they really, uh, you know, we really need to, to uh, allocate uh, resources to both of them. I do think that women with power are still a bit scary. And I do think that you um, hesitate to really invest and really, really support the power of women in this sense, and that that is at least part of it. Um, I think that in times that we uh, encounter now, um, it's important to build on these initiatives, and I do think that feminist foreign policy actually works. I think that some of the challenges, uh, at least from where I sat at the time as, as a minister for gender equality, both with the domestic and international responsibility, from the beginning, I think that there was a lack of perhaps connection between, let's say, the national feminists and the feminist foreign policy, because that was th those were groups who worked with the world. <laughs> and I think that national grassroots organizations in any country, and even women works a lot with that, need to be connected. They know about violence against women. They know about the needs for shelters. They know about which women could actually be on lists for m mediation or for political parties or for leadership. Um, they know deep down what the issues are. So I think connection between you know, the policies, diplomats, their money, their circles, and grassroots women is absolutely key. And I think Sweden did that in the, in the world to, to, uh, well, uh, but I think it, it has taken time before the whole society is really part of that, of that ambition to, to um, uh, point to something. And I think that it was perceived sometimes uh, also as more words than action, but I do think now that we see that it actually did mean action. Uh, and um, I think it is also through examples, not least that UN Women has from many countries, it does change who comes to the table, whose voice is important, uh, who is seen as a leader. Um, and I do uh, think that we need to, um, we need to get away from situations where there is a discussion about peace and those who created the violence are those who are seen as legitimate to decide about peace, whereas women who think they have something to say don't even have money to pay for the bus tickets to go through the country. Yeah. And I think that, that's a situation we just you know, really have to understand and solve. And sometimes we, we you, at UN Women, encounter that even that powerful countries and, and even UN agencies would say, could you fund tiny UN women compared to many of the others, you know, those women's bus ride to the table? And it's like, maybe you can because you are, you know, you, you are the one who has the power and the money. So I think we need still to shift this thinking of who is important. Uh, but my answer, I think, um, Lena, to your question, um, uh, how does this, it, does it work? Yes. 
how does it work? Well, it works well. Uh, it's a good ve vehicle to achieve the main goals of peace and prosperity, uh, to address poverty, which is the theme of this OCSW, um, and to not perpetuate violence. Uh, but I do think, as always, when we talk about women's rights, committed from uh, commi um, to be committed not only uh, from the feminist side themselves, but from the whole society. That is really the thing, and to really invest in in women and children, uh, and have a vision and and a thought with that, and also propose legislation and and reform with the goal of shifting that power speaking out and defending and financing reforms that are actually aim for that power shift that is really important it's seldom it's seldom a, a by effect or something else if you want to shift that power you have to speak about that and express your political will so i think it is a lot about that thank, thank you. you so much <laughs> Thank you for um, you know, having a critical look at what has been happening. I know that um, um, a minister has to leave us, so... Um, Unfortunately, don't worry. <laughs> we have to run. Thank you so much. We're thank, you. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you. But it was a pleasure meeting you all, and I wish I had more time. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All the thank best. You. I, I'm, I'm going to do a, um, um, a minor shift in the program, so moving from uh, ex UN women to current UN women, and then, uh, <laughs> and then to Aruna, just because it makes um, some things you know, it makes sense to continue on on uh, on that flow. So, I want to welcome a very dear friend, Lopa Banerjee, the director of the civil society division at uh, at UN Women, and. Um, we often talk, Lopa, uh, and we're, I think we're both equally worried about the increasing polarization, the increasing inability to have a proper conversation uh, on, on, on many fronts, and also on the rise of the anti-rights, anti-gender uh, uh, movements, which in many parts of the world happen to be militarized as well. It's not just a tough conversation. It's actually a very unequal uh, conversation. Yeah. And we talk also about, you know, this is considered to be uh, um, you know, what our, gover our governments in the Global South are interested in, which is matters of national security. They are matters of national security. But it doesn't matter when the impact is on the, on the lives of uh, women and girls and non-binary folks and so on. So, um, so I wanted to ask you to just basically think about the connections and the links between this increasingly um, obviously uh, a violent rise in anti-rights movement, the ways in which national security sees it uh, equally. I mean, it sees it and it sees gender equality equally as, as a threat, both of them as a threat. And where do you see uh, uh, um, feminist foreign policies and everything that you've done so far in relation to, to generation equality as basically trying to navigate what is otherwise an explosive, uh, eco explosive literally, literally and figuratively uh, ecosystem. So over to you, Lopa. Thank you, Lena, and uh, thank you first. Very, thank you very much for this lovely venue. Of course, such a such an intimate conversation but also for staging this conversation uh, at, this, at this very, very consequential time. Um, at all points in time when feminist foreign policy, were, the idea came up and uh, this was uh, developed, at a, at, even at its outset, at all times, it is important. But at this point in time, when it is such a moment of consequence in the world, when nearly half the world is going to be heading to the polls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you know whether you are having elections in your country or not, those polls that are taking place in over 60 countries of the world, including yeah. the largest democracies, will affect the manner in which mm -hmm. the foreign policy and relations are affected and this this, this question. So to that, 
you know, I'm going to actually talk, I'm going to separate your question from talking about, you know, what is a feminist lens when we talk about this? How does that apply when we talk in terms of foreign policy and then today's world? So the feminist lens, you know, the starting point is that feminist movements broke apart the idea that some people counted more than others. And so in itself, a feminist lens fundamentally, and may, oh, you know, many people spoke about it, challenges the hierarchies of power, both implicit and explicit. Institution Alicia spoke of the manner in which um, you know, the feminist foreign policy is being institutionalized internally within the institutional structures themselves. Uh, but it promotes also the notion of individual and collective agency. And then the aspects of solidarity, equity, access, autonomy, and accountability are cornerstones of any kind of feminist framing or thinking. What does that mean when we are applying it to foreign policy? It means that it is diplomacy that promotes diversity and inclusion, not just internally, but diversity and inclusion as an objective of foreign policy and, 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 and diplomatic engagement. Non-discrimination. So that non-discrimination is, a, is, a, is an objective, both a framing objective and a policy objective. And of course, equal opportunities, dialogue, and networking. But it also means, in today's context, that a foreign policy that is feminist is looking at center staging as a policy objective, alliances and coalitions with movements involved in the safeguarding of democracy and rights. And uh, a, a, a foreign policy framing that prioritizes solidarity. Because what are we in terms of, if, if we now come to today's world, um, of course, you know, the progress on gender equality has been glacial glacially so slow. And this is one of the reasons why the whole foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy um, you know, initiative came up. Of course, there is, you know, we know all the sluggish political will, not enough investment in uh, gender equality, you know, the pushback that everybody has talked about. But what we are seeing in, in nations today is communities that are impoverished by global pandemics, climate catastrophes, austerity measures, volatile and insecure economies, eroding trust in public institutions because they are failing to deliver goods and services to, the pe to their people. And this is leading to disintegrating faith in democratic systems and democratic systems that are atrophied. And so you have disillusioned citizens who are not engaging w within, within the, the governance structures and are creating this vacuum that undemocratic actors are stepping into. And so, in the world, we have the return of power politics and a contested multipolar world, the threats and challenges that are linked to specific geographical focal points in the world, as well as all of the emerging and, and transnational threats related to uh, you know, cyber security, terrorism, etc. So in this context, what is the call for feminist foreign policy today, looking at this uh, situation? It has to be that the feminist foreign policy uh, demand or the framing, and in that it is different from conventional foreign policy, is that it is able to develop the partnerships and strategies that is able to address national conservatism and the politics, what I'm calling the politics of grievance, the against policies in countries, you know, against immigrants, against LGBTI people, against the racially marginalized, against minorities, the against politics that are part of national conservatism 
the fe feminist foreign policy, when we talk in terms of what it is doing externally and internally, this has to be able, feminist foreign policy has to be able to frame this. Mm -hmm. And in this, it is different from uh, a conventional policy. It has to be able to be a strong voice that argues against the capture of state institutions, you know, courts, universities, independent press. We are not seeing that framing in feminist foreign policy in its specific ways now that addresses this. And to focus, I mean, there is such an opportunity because of the way in which it was instituted and its principles of feminist framing for feminist foreign policy to really focus on consensus building in global diplomacy. And, and that is crucial for advancing gender equality and it is completely hobbled right now in this environment of, of distrust. And so for feminist foreign policy to be able to support multilateral feminist activism. You know, feminist activists have worked forever between, in, you know, with policymakers in national and in international spaces with the UN for gender equality outcomes. But it is this activism, this feminist multilateral activism, and these alliances, these spaces for shared uh, policy dialogue <coughs> are facing this ferocious and coordinated pushback from multilateral actors themselves, the governments. And so to reinforce global solidarity and provide an entry point for countries to advocate in international forums together on feminist principles, this is a key, key ask of the framing of feminist foreign policy in, in, in today's context, to prioritize the multi-stakeholder alliances, you were talking about it earlier, Osa, to be able to do the, point, uh, the, the inclusive open spaces for dialogue that you referred to, Alicia, in terms of the manner in which uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the dialogue in Mexico will take place. Mm -hmm. Really prioritizing this intergenerational and intersectional solidarity building. Uh, um, and, and, and being able to amplify what is happening. Of course, there are um, all of the various actors that, ha that have got um, feminist foreign policy or, or foreign policy that prioritizes gender equality outcomes are, are driving money in different ways now to, to uh, community groups and women's rights groups. And, uh, uh, but to be able to na navigate and negotiate the political and fiscal space within countries for these groups to work. It's not just enough to drive money, but there has to be an advo uh, advocating for the expansion of the space for these actors to work uh, uh, within this. And we can uh, come back to the, to, the, to the Swana region and the countries of the Swana region. I think that there is such an important opportunity at this point in time for this where it, there is an ability right now to create a new framing around gender inequality as a national security issue. Yes. Um, you know, gender inequality creates social fragmentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah. and so promoting social cohesion and in, in the countries of the Swana region, um, you know, uh, this is also uh, so culturally specific. Women are the glue. You know, the women create networks. They are, they operate, they create uh, through their engagement, um, you know, social cohesion. So uh, denying women the ability to have space in public and private space to be able to create those networks of solidarity in public and private spaces, that results in, uh, 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 in, in creating conditions of insecurity. And I think this framing of a different understanding of security from as, as uh, located in inequality, is a diff is, is, it takes it out of the militarization mm -hmm. framework. And there's, it's an opportunity to really think through this and create an, and bring some you know, examples uh, uh, around this. So um, I'm going to stop here to say that, uh, you know, 
the, the notion of, of feminist foreign policy or foreign policy that, that prioritizes gender equality outcomes has driven a lot of, uh, of, of different engagement. But at this point in time, the framing that set it up no longer holds in the context of a very contested and polarized environment. Yeah. And therefore, the ability of the foreign policy uh, framing to address that polarization from that feminist lens will have to be key for it too. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Lopa. It's, um, well, we'll be hearing Lopa soon in Lebanon, hopefully, talking about, <laughs> shall I uh, spill the bean? What is the topic of our conversation? Please. <laughs> the, the disagreeable conversations, I think. And I think what Lopa brings every time is the ability to disagree, to discuss the root causes of the disagreement and what can be fixed and what, you know, we have to accept it, it shall never be fixed. So, but thank you so much, Lopa. Um, I want to turn to Dr. Aruna Rao. Uh, Aruna is first, of course, a very um, long time friend, I would say. Uh, she's, uh, I'm very, very proud to say that she's a senior international fellow at the Asbury Institute, uh, and also the chair of Oxfam International Board of Directors. But also Lopa is, uh, sorry, R uh, Aruna is, many, many, many more things, and, you know, uh, and a celebrity in her own right as an amazing global feminist activist. Um, so again, when we were discussing, you know, uh, what, how we will frame the conversation here, I think we wanted to talk uh, about, in your view, and given that the work that you've been doing um, recently, in the recent year, what would make a feminist foreign policy meaningful, impactful, relevant in a world that is becoming, again, very difficult to understand and to deal with, and in a world that is becoming very uh, violent, very discriminatory, and very oppressive. What would make feminist foreign policies impactful and meaningful in such a challenging context, I would say globally? Uh, well, it's a thank easy you. question. Huh? It's a easy question. <laughs> it, it is, yes, yes. Why not tackle it? Um, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here um, in this gorgeous setting. Uh, delighted to be connected to the Asfari Institute. And um, hello, everybody. Um, I'd, I'd like to say, first off, feminist foreign policies are not my area of expertise. Um, I am a feminist advocate, a researcher. Um, uh, I uh, can ask some questions, and maybe uh, you know there are many others who are much better placed than me to answer those questions. But um, that's kind of what I think I'll do. Um, there, you know, there are many instruments for addressing the kinds of gender inequality challenges we have been talking about for decades, right? Yeah. There are many, many, many. CEDAW is one of them, you know, 1325. Name, you can name many, many. But here we're talking about feminist foreign policies. Okay. Um, one of the big challenges is it's unclear what feminist foreign policies actually mean. Absolutely. Okay, there, uh, what is it? How many countries now? I thought 19. 17, 19. 19 you're saying, Alicia. Can I say including Libya? Uh, I don't know what to think about okay. this. But okay, okay. <laughs> so, so 19 countries have said they have a feminist foreign policy, um, but what does that mean? It's hard to discern because this is kind of a moving train. Exactly. Okay, yeah. so yeah. gender. I I am the co-founder of Gender at Work, as some of you may know. Uh, I started the Gender at Work podcast a couple of years ago. Our most recent podcast was on feminist foreign policies. Are they really feminist? Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to go listen. <laughs> um, in that podcast, we talked to your friend mm -hmm. Margot Wallström. 
right? Said, okay, so what was in 2014 when you developed this? As you rightly pointed out also, there were three things that Margaret was interested in particularly, rights, representation, and resources, okay? Um, now, the way in which that has gotten interpreted by a number of different countries, including Mexico, we also spoke to Nadine Dasman, whom you know very well, um, is in terms of, okay, looking at gender parity issues within the Foreign Service. Um, so, you know, Nadine said, as, as Alicia pointed out earlier, putting gender equality at the center, which means more opportunities for women in the Foreign Service. It means promoting gender equality in foreign policy generally, trade agreements, other things like that. Now, there is actually a, a index that many of you are probably familiar with, which uh, Lyric Thompson did at ICRW some time ago, that looks, that's really built on, on Margot's vision, mm -hmm. right? All right. Now, there is a very different way of thinking about what should a feminist foreign policy do, okay? And, and I think, and I, I, I would put to us that it, the way in which we're interpreting it silos us. It silos us into focusing on, Beth just, you know, the other day, Beth Warnick, um, in a, in a LinkedIn post reminded us that OECD DAC has put out its latest data on yeah. where is the money going, yeah. right? The money, official yeah. money, ODA to women's organizations to gender equality is at 4%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I point that out because are we going to focus on that 4% in the broader context, looking at gender parity, et cetera, or are we going to say, what really does feminist foreign policy mean? And, you know, Lopa started on this. I'm going to challenge you a bit. Feminist foreign policy is not only about diplomatic relations. It's about military policy. It's about trade. It's about investment. It's about commercial interests. It's about intelligence services. It's about crime, right? And it requires a rethink a fundamental rethink in the way countries relate to each other, right? So luckily, there's also a very other good index available. I don't know if Fortini is in the room. No, she's not here. She's, she's not. not. Here. Okay, yeah. well, <coughs> Fortini Papagiotti, who is at RCRW, she's the director for advocacy and strategy. And, you know, thank God for her, when she was sitting around doing her master's, came up with an absolutely brilliant idea. Hey, let's look at lots of other issue areas. Why don't we look at peace and militarization, how much money is going into militarization, how much money is going into defense budgets. Let's look at ODA. Let's look at migration. Let's look at um, uh, protections for labor. Let's look at economic justice, institutional commitments that governments have made, and climate. Okay, That's a really good index. Sweden comes out on top. Um, the U.S. comes out at the bottom. No, I think Israel comes out at the bottom. But, you know, U.S. and Israel are at the bottom, as it should be. Um, so that index gives you a clue as to how to unpack what feminist foreign policy is, which is not only about gender parity. It's not only about how do you look at gender equality within these uh, trade agreements and other agreements. It is about challenging the fundamental notion of what is national security, moving it towards a notion of human security, mm -hmm. okay? And if you don't do that, we are constantly siloed into, oh yeah, you women go play over there, and we big guys are gonna talk about trade and militarization <laughs> yeah. and defense spending mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Now, okay, don't take my word for it. Let's look at Yemen. Let's look at Gaza, right? Where there was recently a meeting in November in The Hague where a number of feminist foreign, uh, countries who proclaim they have a feminist foreign policy met. The women, the German women, were challenging their German foreign minister, saying, we want to talk about Gaza, and it was shut down. I'm, I'm astounded at what the German government can do. The German government, I'm finding out, can tell particularly 
immigrants who are Germans, so a Syrian German or a you know Iranian German or a Turkish. Lebanese German can tell them can if they're you know speaking in an open civil society space can tell them don't you go there we're watching you yeah. okay this is a country that has declared it has a feminist foreign policy okay so what do we have here we have a continuum that's the kindest way to put it. A continuum of what is feminist foreign policy, okay? On the one hand, there are these you know, issues that all of my colleagues have talked about. Nobody is really challenging at a governmental level. You know, it's nobody is looking at that whole picture. What is defense spending? What is, you know, what are all of these issues? And in fact, the last OECD sort of review of uh, when they reviewed the, the gender equality strategy, um, you know, recently after 15 years, and I know because I, Joanne Sandler and I wrote a paper for it, um, you know, we raised this issue about the right hand can say one thing, and if the left hand is doing something completely different, that is not feminist. That does not get us to where we need to go. So I think we need to question that. Um, what is the bar for joining this club? I'm not clear. I don't think anybody is really clear. Mm -hmm. Libya has joined. Excellent. Um, no. Libya it's hasn't joined? You just said excellent. that. It's <laughs> I'm just saying it's not excellent. No, I'm saying, I mean, what is the bar? What is the bar? What is it really about, right? What's the, what's the cost of, you know, uh, what, who am I accountable to if I say I have adopted a feminist foreign policy? I mean, um, in every country it's very controversial, right? So in Mexico, Mexico came out number three on the, that index that Fotini, you know, developed, the ICRW index. And of course, Mexican feminists have challenged Mexico saying, how can you say that when the domestic violence against yeah. women, right, mm -hmm. the violence mm -hmm. against women in Mexico is so high? Mm -hmm. How can you, with a brave face, say that? I mean, you know, so that's a that's an internal political issue in in Mexico that women feminists in Mexico are bringing up. Um, I've given you an example of what German feminists are doing, and then how they've been slapped out. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is that this is very unclear what it is. It goes from one end to the other. But I think we shouldn't lose the no the idea. We shouldn't let go of the idea that we have many instruments for looking at gender equality issues. Many fora for looking at that, but this is a particular niche. This is a particular space to look at how do, you, how do you shift this national interest, which has been defined, as also said, by men, for men, elite men, in spaces where there aren't any women around. How do you shift that notion and really challenge that notion of what is state security, you know? And, and where these countries, with feminist foreign policies, choose to speak out and choose not to speak out, okay? So let's take the example of Sweden. Sweden, when Margot Wallström was uh, mm -hmm. minister, um, criticized Saudi Arabia for its human rights abuses, right? Luckily, the prime minister at the time supported her, but that wasn't the case when a Canadian foreign minister, a few la years later, did a very similar thing, right? Okay, these are all stories, by the way, that a good friend of mine, a very brilliant political scientist, Anne-Marie Goetz, has told me. And if you really want to you know, get a very good analysis, go to stuff that Anne-Marie Goetz writes. So Canada had a very different um, response to this. So they backtracked. So when you, you know, so when can you, uh, when can you call out the human rights abuses of your allies Right? under the guise of a feminist foreign policy, and when can you not, right? When, when, I mean, what do, we're all facing Gaza, a continuing, continuing genocide, continuing genocide, right? And 
okay, the United States has not said it's going to have feminist foreign policy. I can't imagine it ever would. But many European countries that have declared a feminist foreign policy are arming Gaza to, uh, are arming Israel to the teeth. And that is causing the genocide of women and children in Gaza. So we cannot, on the one hand, say we care about women and children and then not question the foreign policy um, directions of countries that have said you know, that, that this is their policy and are acting in a very different way. Okay? So there, that's a fundamental contradiction. So let's focus in on that contradiction. You, know, you, you cannot talk about um, nutrition of women and girls in Yemen and at the same time be you know, allowing Saudi Arabia to fuel, you know, to get their fuel to bomb yeah. Yemen. Uh, uh, these things just don't work. They just don't sit together. So are we going to have a very siloed approach? Or are we going to have a very, are we going to have a more intersectional approach, right? If we do have a more intersectional approach, then we are in hot water. We are in kind of uncharted territory because generally the, these two issues don't come together. The gender equality work and the work on you know, national security interests have been always kept apart. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, so the question is, if we need to, and feminist foreign policy is, is, a, is a really important lever. It's an important lever to get at these issues. Mm -hmm. How do you use it to get at these issues in a way that exposes the contradictions? in a way that supports activists who are exposing the contradictions and in a way that you know that that we don't pat ourselves over the the back saying hey you know we we've, we've done really well in terms of getting you know 40% women now within the foreign service you know <coughs> uh, last year we had 35 let's look at some of these other issues um, because we've got lots of other instruments that look at these these yeah. questions of parity now, uh, I mean, another, I think, a really important question, and, um, and I think Lopa touched on this in terms of talking about, you know, foreign policies uh, should center, feminist foreign policy should center solidarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what we're not seeing, uh, what we're not seeing in the case of, say, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, of course, is, right, it's a, a total, I, I, total disaster when it comes to, and, and a unique kind of disaster when it comes to women's rights, right? I don't know, 54 out of the last 86 edicts have to do with women. Um, uh, and there, there is no collective voice of governments around what is a feminist, what is an approach, what is a feminist approach to addressing that issue. Similarly, again, I have to say, um, with Gaza. So can countries raise their collective voice around these issues? Um, and if not, why not? You know, what is, what is the cost? Because as, as activists, we're disappointed. We're dismayed that this isn't happening. We're dismayed when governments tell us, no, we're not going to be talking about that. You know, Germany says it has a practical feminist foreign policy. And in the case of Ukraine, you know, they, they have, they have um, of course, you know, armed and, and supported the war uh, against Russia. But when it comes to Palestine and Gaza, is it racism that keeps them from doing that? What is it, you know? I mean, I, I think it's good to put these questions on the table because some of these policies are in fact racist. Um, it's also really important for feminists, and I think feminists are trying to do this, but with very, very little resources, trying to, and maybe they're not doing it. Maybe they're not doing it enough. Certainly the voices in the United States, um, you know, where I live, um, there is no, I mean, we all pay taxes to the US government, but there is no collective domestic feminist voice that is taking this government or trying to hold this government to account. There are lots of protests 
A lot of those protests are from the diaspora, dias, diaspora community. A lot of it is student-led. Um, there are many communities, uh, you know, Jewish communities who have led that protest, the not-in-my-name communities. But the feminist sort of, the, the feminist presence or, or whether, you know, whether you call it feminist or women's organizations actively doing that in the United States is really, hasn't been there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can we as, as women, as feminists, be more organized to, um, to use our positions as, you know, as taxpayers, as people who, as a kind of a watchdog on, you know, our own governments. That's another piece of that security. Uh, another piece of that solidarity um, uh, question. Um, so, I think what I'm I'm going to do is to say, you know, Gandhiji. I come from India, so I should say something about Gandhiji. <laughs> uh, Gandhiji was once asked, as you all know, what does he think of the idea of Western civilization, and he said, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> And so uh, I leave you with the idea, you know, here that feminist. What do I think of feminist foreign policies? I think it would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for raising the questions because certainly this is work in progress. I don't think. Um, I think we're all in that phase of trying to understand what fits and what works for us, but also trying to understand or trying to pose at least the complicated and uncomfortable questions. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, I want to move to Rahel, um, Rahel Baker. The, she, Rahel is the UN representative and senior advocacy officer at Women's Refugee Commission. Uh, and she's also a colleague uh, with the NGO CSW, she's you're the treasurer of the executive committee, and I've just realized that I have failed to mention at the very beginning that this event is co-organized, is 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 a, a, a collaborative effort, and it's co-organized by AUB, the permanent mission of Mexico at the UN, and. Finland as well, so I'm sorry I forgot this, in partnership with both UN Women and NGO CSW. So thank you so much um, for basically being part of this and being part of this very important and timely conversation. Rael, um, so you, you know, we've had a, a, a really good conversation before um, thinking about global issues, particularly in relation to women and girls women and girls, uh, refugees. And yeah. we know that this is a global issue, that this is, a, um, you know, it's going in crescendo and it's not likely to be resolved any anytime soon. Um, so, the, and I think, you know, we discussed the ways in which, in your opinion and where you stand in your position, um, how, to, how would it be possible to at least address and resolve maybe not resolve, maybe just address uh, the increasing oppression of women and girls and non-binary folks who are refugees across uh, the globe with an instrument such as feminist foreign uh, uh, policy. So with, what can make them, again, impactful at this level, looking at the growing problem, I don't want to call it problem because it seems like it's the problem refugees are the problem, right. but the growing context that is pushing people to move against their against their will. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Abu Habib. Thank you to the Asfari Institute. And I'm very humbled to be lucky last uh, in this group. And as uh, former Minister Regner said, people are afraid of powerful women, then this room must be absolutely terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so the Women's Refugee Commission, we engage on feminist foreign policy and on the Women, Peace and Security framework because these are mutually, mutually reinforcing frameworks. So FFP and WPS, um, I hope it's okay if I slip into acronyms, um, they have common goals, right? They both seek to uphold human rights, increase resources and increase representation of women across all spaces in leadership 
political representation, um, and both are rooted in the same principle that international cooperation cannot come at the expense or be subordinated to national interests. So our work in both spheres is aimed at <coughs> strengthening protection mechanisms for forcibly displaced women, girls, and people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identities, and also promoting their meaningful engagement in all aspects of decision making and their leadership in conflict prevention, humanitarian response, peace negotiations, and peace building. So I um, had the great privilege of also being at uh, two important conferences that happened uh, this past November. So the first was our conference in The Hague, um, and um, Ambassador Masu was there as well um, and gave a fantastic presentation, uh, which we all appreciated. Um, so I want to share a couple of reflections from that conference and from the one that was right after, which was the Women, Peace, and Security Focal Points Network, in which I am also um, an active member as WRC's UN representative. So throughout the, both conferences, it was clear, and particularly the FFP conference, <coughs> that the discourse around feminist foreign policy is gradually shifting in a positive direction. We are moving toward greater inclusion, realization of the aspirations for achieving this shared framework for foreign policy that's gender inclusive, gender affirming, anti-racist, and anti-colonial. It's remarkable that now we have 19 FFP countries, and we have 107 countries that have national action plans for implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security framework. So this is all positive. The other positive is that the F of the FFP is undefined. And we want to keep it this way. Because in, if we were to impose a monolithic definition of feminism, we would be undermining the goal of being anti-colonial and having global equity, right? Because feminism, as we know, is uh, relative and means different things depending on geography, cultural context, ethnicity, and people's lived experiences. So we, we want to keep it that way. Um, throughout the conference, government and civil society, you know, we address broad foreign policy considerations, trade and economy, climate, strategies for in promoting equity among high GDP and low and middle income countries, which were all good things. Um, so while we have all this positive momentum and positive momentum in these new national action plans, it's also important, I think, to, to ground ourselves in this moment and kind of zoom out and look at the global reality when it comes to forcibly displaced people. So the overarching goal, um, as we mentioned, of, of both of these frameworks is to, is to promote greater international cooperation. But right now we have more than 600 million that 600 million women and girls who live in conflict-affected contexts. And there are an estimated 110 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, more than half of whom are women and girls. So um, we also see recently the conflict in Sudan where 10.7 million people have fled and another million are internally displaced. We're looking at the war in Ukraine, which caused 6 million Ukrainians to flee and upwards of 8 million internally displaced. And mind you, these are almost, I can't say all, but the vast majority of the, the, the Ukrainian population are women and girls because men are not allowed to leave the country and men are being sent to the military, being sent to the front lines. Um, you know, we, we're all mentioning Gaza, um, but it's important to also keep in mind that right now, as we sit in this room, there are 1.5 million people stuck in Rafah along the Egypt Egyptian border in increasingly dangerous and deteriorating conditions. We also see conditions in Syria deteriorating where people have been now displaced multiple times. So starting in 2010, with the civil war, we see women and girls being forcibly displaced. And then we see, because of sectarian violence that is increasing, these populations are displaced again. Then because of the earthquake, they're further displaced. So while all of that is happening, we also just witnessed, um, very alarmingly, um, a measure by Pakistan to forcibly return Afghan refugees, many of whom had been there since the 1980s, 
um, and they forcibly returned them to Afghanistan. And this constitutes a clear violation of Pakistan's obligation as a party to the UN Convention Against Torture and under customary international law to the principle of non refoulement So in addition to these active conflicts, it doesn't stop there. We're seeing conditions everywhere, DRC, Yemen, Myanmar, Haiti, and in every country that's currently on the Security Council agenda get worse for women, girls, and people of diverse ODS. And we are seeing more countries, including this one, close their doors to refugees and people who are fleeing conflict and, and seeking safety. We, Egypt is closing its doors to Sudanese who are fleeing and to Palestinians. Um, Turkey is closing its doors to Syrians. And throughout Europe, we've seen rise in the xenophobia, which is bolstered by this anti-gender movement. So the tensions between national interests and the imperatives of multilateralism play out in the Security Council every day. We have the, the permanent five members are continuously using their veto power to advance national interests at the expense of advancing action on conflict resolution and humanitarian intervention. And this is most glaringly evidenced by Russia discontinuing the Black Sea Grain Initiative in t July 2023, which increased food insecurity in Africa. Also this past July, the Council failed to renew the Syria cross-border aid mechanism, which had previously allowed for the delivery of humanitarian assistance to internally displace Syrians into non-government controlled areas without requiring the, position, the, the permission of the Assad regime. That's also gone. We're also facing the drawdown of UN mandates in countries like Sudan. UNITAM is now dissolved. In DRC, the MINUSCO mandate is now resolved, uh, dissolved. rather. And in all of these contexts, we have, at the same time, the protection mechanisms that were supposed to be in place are not working. We have rising rates of gender-based violence. We have increasing prevalence of conflict-related sexual violence. And the perpetrators are acting with total impunity. So we have protection gaps in almost everywhere in the world where you have conflict, crisis, forcibly displaced populations. There are major protection gaps. And it is getting worse. So all of these developments point to an urgent need to reassess our approaches to protection and to participation. And so while a lot of the goals of feminist foreign policy overlap with the longstanding commitments of women, peace, and security, the feminist foreign policy can, at the very least, provide a unifying political f framework for these disparate strands of gender-related strategies that are being implemented by governments, improve coordination and effectiveness, and in and involvement at the highest levels of government. Um, so, but what's glaringly absent in all of this, um, and going back to reflections on the con on the conference, is you know while we're talking about trade, um, we had an entire session on feminist foreign policy and trade without once mentioning sanctions regimes and the impact of sanctions regimes yeah. on women's civil society. Um, there were a lot of other gaps, and there's a heavy focus on gender parity and on increasing women in leadership. Yes, we need to increase women in leadership, but not just on the virtue of somebody's gender, right? We need to increase women with gender expertise, um, and just putting a woman in power, does not it's not a box-ticking exercise, right? When we see meaningful engagement and meaningful participation, we actually mean meaningful. Right, <laughs> an, an actual shift, right? Um, so in, you know, um, Dr. Rao, you mentioned that um, there's no domestic movement for uh, a feminist foreign policy in the United States. Um, I'm happy to say that that's not entirely true. So the Women's Refugee Commission um, was part of the Feminist Foreign Policy Coalition in the United States. Um, and this is a, co uh, a coalition that is working to influence the United States government to develop a feminist foreign policy that would complement their new national action plan. So the United States government recently launched this new national action plan and a national strategy on women, peace, and security implementation. So WRC and our coalition partners are of the view that countries that are implementing a feminist foreign policy 
can and should look deep, more deeply into the military trade nexus, look more critically at the harmful economic and trade policies, including extractive industries, and their migration and asylum policies, just to name a few. So some advocates of feminist foreign policy discuss whether increases in military spending should, can or should be justified if you have an FFP. And we question if specific military exports to countries, as um, Dr. Rao was discussing, with a poor record on women's rights is really the best way of dealing with authoritarian actors that oppress women. So some of these debates, including the one on sanctions and the use of military force, are far from settled. Um, in the advocacy work that we do, we shift the discourse away from calling for an end to military spending full stop. What we do is we talk about security sector reform, which I want to get into more in more detail later, and focusing on conflict prevention, right? Um, because it's when you start talking to member states about, you know, you need to stop military spending, it's almost a dead end ar argument because they have a legal right to protect their sovereignty and to protect their national borders. And they have, you know, you're not going to stop countries from spending on their own military. Um, and I know that the realpolitik is quite depressing. Um, but if you, in the work that we're doing in influencing member states, if you shift that conversation towards conflict prevention, towards strengthening women-led civil society um, as a means to conflict prevention, we have found that that gains more traction um, and you can get a little bit further. So back to our work with the U.S. government. Um, so we've been working with the Biden-Harris administration and they have had a lot of opportunities so far to apply a feminist lens to the current challenges both here in the U.S. and abroad. Again, due to all of these multiple protracted complex crises and newly erupting wars. So we've been working with them on the Ukraine, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Ethiopia, um, and also on the crackdown on women's rights in Iran. Um, after the Dobbs de decision, um, the United States lost its moral high ground. Again, as you were saying, um, are we really in a position <laughs> to lecture other member states about their progress on gender inequality when we just strip reproductive choice away from our own citizens? Um, so this all, all of these these movements and all of this lobbying um, has set the tone for increased civil society action and increased civil society activism that has generated a critical mass around all these issues. So the administration has launched this national gender equity and equality strategy. Um, and this is sort of their way of incrementally moving toward an FFP. So it's not saying, okay, the United States government is ready to have a feminist foreign policy. It's saying the United States government recognizes that in all of our foreign relations, in uh, again, across the full spectrum, we are going to center gender equality, um, which, which is good, but it's not necessarily the same as committing to gender transformative approaches. So despite all those incremental, um, incremental progress, there's really a lack of a meaningful focus on gender in the national security strategy. Um, and again, this leads us back to the question of how can we discuss a feminist foreign policy if we are replicating the same discourse and using the same, the same models for security? It just doesn't work. A feminist foreign policy needs also to be rooted in security sector reform. Um, and this is why. Because the US government's um, WPS framework, and sorry if I'm jumping around here a lot, stick with me because I am getting somewhere. Um, the, the WPS yeah. framework is, seeks to promote conflict prevention, but also includes explicitly countering violent extremism and countering terrorism. Okay, this sounds good, right? Wrong. <laughs> Both CVE and CT, countering violent extremism and countering terrorism, have been instrumentalized to criminalize forcibly displaced populations, to criminalize asylum seekers, to criminalize yeah. migrants, 
to close borders, and to justify policies that push people back out into the Mediterranean where they drown, to push people back into the Sahara where they die from exposure, and to keep push people at, on our border mm -hmm. um, where we have a severe crisis um, that we are we're working to address. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that we are working together <laughs> to address it, but um, it's, it's dire and it's getting worse every Absolutely. day. And this argument of, well, we have to protect our borders from terrorists um, does not work because we know that the vast majority of people who are seeking safety are women, girls, people who are criminalized on the basis of their sexual orientation exactly. and gender identity. <coughs> they are not drug gangs and criminals and, and terrorists. Exactly. So, yeah. So we'll just fix that and go to work. <laughs> very <laughs> good. <laughs> so, so getting back to how... I'm on board. There you go. There you go. Um, so I, I don't want to get too much into the Security Council resolutions and everything. I'm happy to discuss that more in, in the Q&A. But I do want to talk about a couple, just two areas for, for growth and expansion and where we see some promising inroads for implementation of both FFP and WPS, again, as, as mutually enforcing frameworks. So the first is in monitoring and accountability. So thank you very much for raising this uh, FFP index that the ICRW started. And we do have our colleagues who from the FFP Collaborative in the room, I believe, unless they have left. They just left? Yeah. Oh, because they knew I was going to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, who I was hoping could speak more to the Feminist Foreign Policy Index and how it's not used to measure or to give a grade to countries on how good their, their policy is necessarily, but more to send a signal that there are benchmarks and we want to take an overall assessment, like a global view of what is the status of FFP, where are the trends, and where can civil society focus our engagement with government and policymakers in order to close the gap, right? So that offers one good tool out of, pardon? There are two indexes. There are two indexes, yes. <coughs> so, but that having this framework overall offers a good tool for monitoring and accountability, but it needs to be expanded and it needs to be systematized in some way, right? Because the other fundamental challenge is that FFP, unlike National Action Plan from WPS, they're not legally binding documents, right? They're yes. just expressions of a country's aspiration and of a country's ethos when it comes to gender equality, which also means that they are inherently partisan and they're political documents, which is why they yeah. can be dispensed of at the whim. A national action plan cannot, because every resolution that is passed by the Security Council is automatically binding upon all member states. So it's a lot harder to ditch your national action plan than it is to ditch your feminist foreign policy. But if they were both subject to the same kind of scrutiny by you know, international scrutiny, um, and held to the same standards of implementation, then I think we would have stronger ground to, to carry all of this momentum forward. So that's another problem that we can fix and then go to lunch. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one. And then the second is looking at resourcing and financing. Um, so the Women's Refugee Commission just concluded our two-year term on the board of the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund which the UN Women serves as the Secretariat. And I'm very happy to say um, that for, for us at the WRC, serving on the board of, of the fund was an extremely proud moment. Um, it is something that I am so proud of, I can't talk enough about the fund. And why is it? Because the, what the fund, we talked about the gap in ODA for gender equality. When it comes to foreign, uh, humanitarian assistance to women-led organizations that are responding to conflict and crisis, it's even less, okay? We're looking at one-tenth of one percent is going to women-led organizations who are on the front lines of conflict and crisis. So UN Women um, and other partners developed this Women Peace and, women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund, which is 
a very brief explanation, a multi-sectoral pooled funding mechanism, which in includes governments, private sector, UN agencies, and civil society members. And it is designed to deliver direct, multi-year, flexible funding into the hands of grassroots women organizations. Um, and it's designed to be very nimble and very agile. So there are three main funding windows. One is a crisis response window, which puts money into the hands of organizations as they're responding to an acute crisis. Um, and during our time on the board, we were able to support opening up new windows to respond to particular country contexts, like the floods in Libya. We, there's also a funding window that provides operational support. So with the understanding that you can't just find, okay, here, here's some money to get through this crisis. No, we're funding sustainability. We're funding the long-term health and vitality of women civil society, again, so that they can operate through across the conflict prevention, humanitarian intervention, peace building, recovery, reconstruction, across that whole continuum. Very good. Which is yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And you're both of, and Mexico is a member. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your contributions to the fund. Um, and then just one, um, the, there's a third funding window, which to me is probably the most illustrative of why we need to include this kind of trust building relationship and this kind of new funding models into feminist foreign policy and as a way of operationalizing WPF implementation. And that's through the third funding wi window, which supports women human rights defenders. So in 2022, um, we opened up this new window. Um, and since then, we have supported 214 women to participate in peace negotiations. Um, and we prioritize participation in track one processes. Because as we know, women are overrepresented in track two and track three, which are, as you said, not, you know, it's like, oh, it's women can talk with civil society on the side, whereas men are gonna be in the track one and talk real business about, you know, security and conflict. Um, but those 214 women who were supported also included 553 dependents. So not only does the fund directly give money to women human rights defenders to, to lead and participate, but they also support their families, um, their dependents, and what does that say? It says that when you directly support women, you support communities. When you directly support women-led organizations, you support democracies. When you directly support women-led civil society, you support conflict prevention, you support peace building, um, and you create stronger, healthier societies. That's, that's the mm -hmm. bottom line. So in closing, I just want to say that from the WRC's perspective, again, the imperative right now is to focus on increasing, uh, closing the gaps in protection, because the purpose of protection is to promote participation, right? So without protection, you can't have participation. And <coughs> looking at those two and how they come together is, I think, where we need to pull our collective efforts. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you for taking us where things are happening with, you know, people's lived experiences and how each and every decision, each and every tool, and each and every decision around funding affects women and girls in their real lives. Thank you so much. Um, in closing, I just wanted to say when I was preparing the run of show for this event, it was beautiful. It was in the <laughs> by the minute, and it was yeah. three rounds of questions, and and you know, uh, and of course, none of this matter right now. So uh, you've covered. Uh, everything that we had agreed to cover, except without the beautiful organization that I had put. <laughs> but thank you ever so much. Uh, Aruna, Osa, Alicia, Lopa, uh, and Rahel, uh, and also uh, the minister. Um, and I think we can see the different perspectives and the different entry points. And certainly what we can say is that this is the part of this um, 
long-term process of having these uncomfortable conversations uh, which we need to continue. So this is not, of course, so what you will be receiving from us, from our colleagues at the New York office, is the recording of the conversation. Very uh, good. But with, uh, with, uh, with our partners with whom we're working on this, I think this is part of uh, what we will be doing next. I mean, we will be moving to next steps in terms of pushing the conversation forward, but also practically what does it mean. So thank you all very much. Um, we can continue the discussion over uh, our luncheon that our colleagues and friends at the New York office are uh, offering. It's this way. Uh, it's this way. Okay, so please join us for uh, lunch and thank you ever so much. This was awesome. Yeah. Uh, 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 u